Following a busy ski season last year, some big changes are coming to Mount Joy Snow Resort. Our Josh Howerluck has more on the hills. While there isn't any snow on Mount Joy yet, there is a lot of fresh dirt and some heavy machinery. Over the past months, crews have been hard at work, bringing new changes to the hill for the upcoming season. So as you can see behind us, uh, one of the biggest changes is our regrading of our bunny hill. Uh, it's been a project that we've been wanting to do for the last couple of years and the success of last year and the great help from the people at the uh, RM of Wilton has, uh, has actually made this uh, come to fruition here. Last year saw a boom in the skiing industry and with ski hills being allowed to remain open with COVID restrictions, more people picked up the sport as a way to get outdoors during the winter. So uh, in the past we've uh, we found that the bunny hill was a little steep uh, so we actually uh, graded that down uh, greatly down to about 8 degrees uh, to accommodate for some of our newer uh, and inexperienced riders to uh, enjoy and learn, um, learn a little bit better. The pitch of the bunny hill was originally between 15 and 20 degrees, which had a similar slope angle to the black diamond runs on the hill. Other changes to the hill will also include a newly renovated rental shop, new snowmaking techniques, and possibly a magic carpet on the bunny hill to come in the future. Josh Howerlack, Primetime Local News. A local arts and antique show is aiming to support the Olive Trees meal programs this weekend. I spoke to one of the organizers to learn more. Today on Primetime Local News, I'm joined by Bonnie Lowen from Reclaim, as she's here to talk about an upcoming art and antique market this weekend. So Bonnie, diving right in, what can you tell people about this third bay sale? Um, well, it's going to be a very fun event. It's this Saturday evening from 6 to 9. And what we've done is over the past a few months, We've been collecting all of the like beautiful original art that we've gotten in, some weird stuff like an alligator head, this beautiful red vintage fur coat, um, things we don't know what they are, but they're awesome. All that kind of stuff that we get donated either at the Olive Tree or here at Reclaim. So we decided to have like an art show for it because it's all, it's just fabulous stuff. It's a fun event, something different to do, and come out and see all the great stuff that Lloydminster has to offer. Plus, it's a great way people donate their awesome things. One man's treasure is another, I mean, one man's junk is another man's treasure, and you donate it. We turn it into cash, which we turn into food for people's hungry mouths. So it works really well. And for people who are interested in the sale, where can they go online to maybe check out some of your merch or learn more? Um, if you're on Instagram, it's Third Bay. If you're on Facebook, it's Third Bay. You can also find the links on Under Reclaim, Olive Tree. Um, you know, all those places will have links to it. But we have previews. Obviously, we haven't taken pictures of everything that we have donated. And who knows what we're going to get donated between today and Saturday that will add to the show. Um, but there is some of the highlights of the things on Instagram and Facebook under Third Bay. Then just before we say goodbye, for people who might want to come and check out the event, maybe make some purchases, see what you guys have to offer, where can they go this weekend? It's going to be held at the Reclaim store. It's in our third bay, thus the name Third Bay. So previous to this, the third bay had all our construction, like windows, doors, tiles, paint, all that kind of stuff in it. So we've cleaned it all out and it's going to be set up like an art gallery. So I'm going to be wearing a party dress. If you feel like coming out dressed up, come out dressed up. But if not, just come as you are. But yeah, it's in the third bay at the Reclaim building. Thanks so much for your time, Bonnie. Okay, thank you. Now we check in with Blake Nath for this week's edition of Retrospect. In 91, farmers from Willington, Saskatchewan met with Agriculture Minister Ernie Isley to air their grievances. 
going under as we there was anger in the Willingdon Hall as farmers sat shoulder to shoulder we glaring at Agriculture Minister Ernie Isley. The hall was packed with over a thousand angry producers. The upstairs was full too with people watching on closed circuit TV. And the spill-off even sat in the curling rink next door to watch Isley for a sign that the government may actually come through with drought aid. To call this meeting a tongue lashing would be a kindness. Farmers were livid. You know, I didn't get 15 average this year. And I'll tell you another trick they're using, the crop insurance people. I was robbed of $20,000 this summer, this fall. And that's the money I should have had to pay my taxes and pay my gas bill. You know what they did to me? They came and they adjusted my crop in the end of July. And they said it's 30 bushel barley. So I left some barley and I crashed 15. You know what they do? They count the stocks and they count the stems, but they don't count what happens in the drought. And the man that adjusted the barley said, you have no mature barley, it's all burnt. I said, you tell those to those dinglings, in, in those where there were shark skin belts and shark skin boots at a farm meeting, and it gets into all the papers. And if that reporter is here, I'd like to tell him there's no shark skin boots or belts here today. I got robbed of twenty thousand dollars in the county. I have no drug, fifteen percent crop, and Ernie doesn't know a drug from a helicopter. You can't tell a bloody drug. <laughs> I've got, you know when they take subtract all, all the grip payments I got, I'm going to be in the deficit. And I got every insurance you can think of. And that's all for this week in Retrospect. Retrospect this week is brought to you by Webb's Ford. Worth your while to drive the extra mile. Webb's Ford in Vermilion. Now to calm things down a little bit, let's check in with Jasmine King for your first look at weather. Thank you, Tate. Yes, we are calming things down a bit. You know, we're at five degrees. This weekend was up a lot higher, so we can say that isn't sticking around throughout today and the rest of this week. But as we look at more around the region, they did. We are sitting around that same degrees throughout six in the border city. And as we can see, Vermilion, Wainwright also at six degrees, St. Paul and Marwain at five and Provost and Bonneville are at seven. So this is the pretty consistent temperature that we are seeing throughout. So we won't be seeing those teens today and maybe not throughout most of this week, but Green Lake, Meadow Lake, St. Walberg, all at six degrees, as well as Pierceland, Maidstone and North Battleford are at seven. But as we look at the satellite radar map, we can see there is a little bit of activity through that Maidstone, North Battleford area. Not too much activity, but there is just that little bit going on. But as we look at North Battleford overnight, we can see they will be getting down to minus six degrees. So now is that time of year where overnight we get a lot colder. So you might have to get out those thick blankets once again. And then tomorrow they will have that high of seven degrees. And as we look at Cold Lake, another place that will be getting colder overnight at minus five. And then tomorrow they will have that high of seven degrees. But as we look at your school day forecast for the kids here in the border city tomorrow, it will be another place will be starting off a bit colder at minus five. So they might need their jackets and mitts when they head off to school and only minus one at recess. So again, not too warm of a recess, but lunch will warm up to three degrees. But by the time school's out, they'll be high at six degrees. So maybe they can spend a little bit of time outside, maybe raking some leaves in the front yard. But as we look at your three day forecast tomorrow, the high will be seven degrees. And as we can see throughout the week, there is that mix of sun and cloud throughout. Wednesday will be at nine, where Thursday's high will be at seven. But that is a look at your three day forecast, and we'll have more news after the break. Welcome back. Organically labeled produce is becoming more popular with Canadian consumers as the specialty food has seen an increase in sales. Our Jillian Code has an interview that helps explain why. 
Today on Primetime Local News, I'm joined by Tia Lofsgaard, who is the Executive Director of the Canada Organic Trade Organization. Now, Tia, organic food in Canada has seen a 33% rise since 2017. What can be attributed to this rise? Well, there's lots of so social, political, and environmental context, I think, to put into it. But um, you know, more that I think about the way that we were raised as the Gen X uh, wow. generation, we were learning about how important it is for us to take um, take control over uh, the food that we eat and really started to understand more of not just eating cheap food, um, really understanding the contents of where it comes from. So I think the more that we're seeing uh, people learn about this, uh, we are having this next generation just demand more and more. And the, you know, the population is changing and we're seeing that um, people are understanding that climate change is something that's very real and needs to be done. So organic is one of those, um, you know, programs out there that allows people to um, know that they're not contributing towards climate change, that they're doing the best that they can in regards to making an impact on their environment. Also, of course, people are concerned about what they're putting in their bodies. They want to try to avoid pesticides and GMOs and um, do everything they can to avoid artificial flavors and preservatives. So organic is um, kind of perfectly positioned right now, particularly with COVID that we saw a huge increase happen uh, over the last year. You know, we were concerned, of course, just like any other industry that there was going to be a food shortage or that it was difficult to get people to come into work or the farms to operate as they usually would. But we actually saw that the industry was able to pull together and uh, most of the companies I know have really been able to uh, meet that demand and it continues to grow. So just since 2017, it's been 14.7% growth um, on the sales side of things, which is huge. And I think you can attribute really that, that social, political, economic uh, context that's driving, driving the demand. It's the, it's, it was the millennials and now it's the centennials that are the largest consumer group in Canada. And, and all consumers know there is a variety of, of food labels that we have our choice from at the grocery store. What are some of the food labels that consumers are looking for the most? Well, we do test this question every year so that we can get a sense of whether organic is still a priority for consumers. And number one thing that people look for in Canada is local. Second is Canadian. And the third is organic. And so considering that you can get a local Canadian organic product, I think that organic is well positioned. We do um, do some testing around, you know, non-GMO claims. Um, there's a glyphosate free label. There's a new label called the regenerative, regenerative organic certified um, that we also test, but the, the most out of the actual certification programs out there, organic is number one. And, and in your guys' report, it shows that Quebec actually leads the country in organic food production as compared to, you know, the, the typical food production provinces like Alberta, Saskatchewan, the prairies. Is there a reason why Quebec has seen such high numbers compared to these prairie provinces? Well, I think if you want um, anything to grow, you have to have intention behind it. And the Quebec government has made a whole action plan called the Sustainable Agriculture Plan. They've put $25 million into ensuring that we move towards more sustainable agriculture uh, over the next five years. They have um, adopted different programs which have very measurable goals uh, to try and achieve, uh, you know, reducing the use of pesticides, uh, preserving soil health, uh, really moving towards more sustainable fertilizers that aren't mined. Um, their action plan really goes into a lot of detail and it's tied into a larger government strategy, which is the 2030 Green Economy Plan. Um, we don't see that kind of action coming out of the prairies right now. In fact, Alberta um, you know, has lost a lot of their agricultural budget, and uh, that's really impacted the organic sector. There's zero people working in the government that are the organic specialists anymore. So it's, um, it's, it's challenging to have such a fragmented situation happening in Canada, where we have one province that's shining, and then we have other provinces that are lagging. And so stay tuned, because we'll be uh, releasing the State of Organics Performance Report, where we go into the details of what each province is doing to support organic and grow it. Um, because, you know, you are seeing some, some shining lights, and I think that other provinces can learn from, from them. 
that it's, and it's been nothing but positive because there's so much demand for organic. We will never be able to suit all the demand. We will always have to import some products because consumer demand, 66% of Canadians are buying organic products weekly. That's a lot. And when we think about the next generation, um, those that are between 18 and 24 are buying a 25%, sorry, what is it? 46% of millennial or centennials are actually uh, spending a quarter of their budget on organic on a weekly basis. So it's not, it's not just, you know, the adults, it's like, it's the kids, it's the next generation that are prioritizing their organic oat milk lattes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, Tia, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Take Have care. Have a great day. Now it's time to take a look at your agriculture prices. Look at the world of hockey. Jace Mackey and Evan Kenny break down the NHL's opening weekend. All 32 NHL teams have now played a game following this first weekend of NHL regular season action. And joining us to give us his studs and duds from the weekend is Evan Kenny. Evan, thanks for being here. Yeah, Jace, it's my pleasure. All right, so first of all, Evan, my question is uh, who are the top performers coming out of this weekend? Well, Jace, there's definitely a number of them, uh, guys that I definitely left off the list. Just unfortunately had to limit it uh, two, three for this opening weekend. Starting things off, I got to go with the great eight, Alex Ovechkin, you know, on his journey to try and beat Wayne Gretzky for the most all-time NHL uh, goals. He got off to a hot start, three goals and two assists already on the season with two goals and two assists Coming in the opening uh, uh, opening game, he now just trails Brett Hull uh, by eight goals and sits fourth all-time uh, trailing, as I mentioned, Brett Hull, Yermer Yager, uh, Gordie Howe, and Wayne Gretzky himself. So on that journey, I definitely got to give a nod to Ovi. Uh, you know, coming up next on my list is Anze Kopitar, captain for the LA Kings, and really their cornerstone. He proved it, you know, already seven points in just two games, five games. Uh, five points in the opening game, including a hat trick, just the third hat trick in franchise history when it comes to opening day games. So he joins Luke Robitaille and Yari Curry uh, in, in that aspect. And then as well, he is the oldest player of all time to record five points in an opening game. He's 34 years old. He passes the great Phil Esposito, who was 31 years old the last time he scored five points in an opening season game. And Jace, my final player here is Connor McDavid. Uh, he scores a hat trick in a huge first battle of Alberta. And to me, in you know big games, your big players have to come to play. And uh, Connor McDavid really did that for his team. All right. So speaking of uh, Connor McDavid in that battle of Alberta, it was nice to have fans back in the stands. I think this was the first battle of Alberta with fans in the stands since February of 2020. There was a lot of intensity in that game, particularly in that first period. So. What did you like from either team in that game? Yeah, I definitely love that intensity, Jace. You know, from the Calgary Flames, they're a Daryl Sutter coach team. They're going to come out and be a physical, energetic type of team. And I personally love that. You know, they, they had the lineup to do that. Um, you know, acquiring guys like Zadorov, a big body defenseman who can still move. Uh, a number of other guys, Eric Branson being one, I thought he had a very good game for the Flames. So I like to see that intensity and that physicalness uh, from the Flames. 27 hits in this game. I think that we will be seeing that sort of game in, game out from the Calgary Flames. So from the Edmonton Oilers, obviously they were able to pull out the win. And I like the response to that physicality. Zach Cassian, you know, dealing with some concussion issues uh, to start off this season. Wasn't necessarily fighting, but he was coming back. He threw six hits of his own. Uh, you know, that third line of Cassian, uh, Derek Ryan, and Warren Fogle had to really step up for the Oilers in that sense. Derek Ryan also stepping up on the score sheet uh, and, and getting a goal there to start off the game. And then finally, Jace, what I liked, uh, again, from the Calgary Flames, I think Jacob Markstrom actually played pretty good. I know he did allow four goals, uh, five with that final empty netter from Connor McDavid, 
but I know he allowed five goals in this game. I think it could have been upwards of six or seven even, you know, if he hadn't made a couple uh, clutch saves. One that really comes to mind was a chance uh, from Leon Dreisaitl that he slid across and, and shut the door there. So I do think I have to give a nod to Jacob Markstrom in this one. All right, Evan. So in the last minutes here, I'll give you final thoughts. What are your final thoughts heading into uh, the second week of uh, regular season action? Well, there's a number of questions still up in the air, Jace, you know, and possibly even more questions uh, because of this first week uh, of action. I'm looking for a response from a number of teams, the Winnipeg Jets being one of them. They dropped two games to a couple of L.A. teams in the Anaheim Ducks and the San Jose Sharks. Now, I think the Winnipeg Jets could be a very competitive team, you know, when it comes time to playoffs. This weekend didn't really prove that, so I'm expecting them uh, to bounce back here. As well, the New York Islanders, another team that I expect to be competitive this year, allowed 11 goals in their first two games. Now, these New York Islanders teams really pride themselves on their defensive play, so expect them to bounce back. And then finally, speaking about defense, the Buffalo Sabres are the top defensive team in the NHL, which... I don't know when the last time anybody heard that was, but it is true, just allowing two goals in two games. So it'll be interesting to see, can this stick, or is it sort of just a first couple game fluke? Well, thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us today, Evan. I'm excited to see how this season is going to unfold. Thank you, Jace. Now, we once again throw to Jasmine King for your second look at this week's forecast. Thank you, Tate. Looking at temperatures here around the region, including the border city, we are at six degrees still. But as we look at Edmonton, Cold Lake and Athabasca all at five. And as we head closer to the mountains, Jasper is five as well as four in Rocky Mountain House. So the Alberta side is a bit colder than the Saskatchewan side. As we can see, they, we have at least some double digits here in Melford and Saskatoon. And then Prince Albert is at eight degrees where North Battleford is still sitting at seven. But as we look into the northern parts of the province, Provinces. We can see that Flin Flon is at 7 and we have pretty consistent temperatures throughout. Buffalo Narrows, La Loche, La Ronge, all at 4 degrees. Walston Lake is down at 2 where, and then we also see some 3s across that northern region. And then we look at high level up at 6, so one of the higher uh, degrees in high level in uh, Alberta. And then Fort Chippewan and Fort McMurray are both at 4 degrees. And then Grand Prairie is down at one, but as we look to the south, we do have some warmer temperatures down here. More consistent double digits. Medicine Hat at 13, Lethbridge at 10, but Calgary is down at five degrees, and Banff and Coronation are both at seven. But as we look just at the Saskatchewan side, we can see there is still some 20 degree marks in the provinces in both Yorkton and Estevan. Estevan at 21, and then Regina and Moose are both sitting at 13 degrees. But another part of the country that has that 20 degree weather is Winnipeg at 21. So they're one of the warmer places that we can see in the country. And then Toronto is at 12 degrees. And as we head further east into the, into the country, we can see Quebec City is at 9. St. John's is at 6 and Halifax is at 10 degrees. And then looking over to the western part of the country. Vancouver is at 12 with that mix of sun and cloud throughout so we can see there is more cloudy conditions across the country. Yellowknife and Whitehorse are both down at zero degrees but as we look tomorrow around the region we will be closer to that 10 degree range but a lot of temperatures are still the same around the area. Lloydminster at seven where Vermilion is also at seven as well as Bonneville and Cold Lake. St. Paul and Marwane are at six and Vagerville is at eight. And then over here on the Saskatchewan side, six seems to be the common number throughout, as we can see that through St. Wahlberg, Meadow Lake, Green Lake, and more. And then Macklin is at eight, where North Battleford is at seven degrees. But as we look at your seven-day forecast for the border city to, on Wednesday, we can see they have that high of nine degrees, which is the average throughout this time of year. So they are pretty consistent right there. But as we look further on into the week, we can see seven degrees throughout, but we will be mainly in those single digits, except for on Monday with that high of 11. But that mix of sun and cloud throughout, but that close to 60% chance of some, some precipitation on Saturday. But that is a look at your seven day forecast. We'll have more news after the break.
sweet love. I'm happy to be joined today on Primetime Local News by Ben Barnes. Ben is joining us today all the way from Los Angeles, which, as we were talking about, is normally sunny, but looks a little gloomy today. Thanks for speaking with us, Ben. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Ben, a lot of people will know you from your acting career, Westworld, The Punisher, uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, but you have now made a bit of a change, and uh, you've released your debut EP. Uh, it's called Songs for You. Tell me a little bit about how this all came about. Is this something you've been working on for quite some time? So it is essentially a dream come true uh, 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 over the last two decades. Um, music was certainly my first passion and my first love. And then uh, slowly the sort of the singing element of, of storytelling got stripped away and I, and I ended up doing more um, sort of dramas and film and television. But uh, over that time, I've obviously nurtured my love of music. And uh, I think once the pandemic hit, it just became one of those um, identity crises uh, where I just figured I will regret not releasing my own songs in my life if I don't do it. And if I don't do it now, when will I? So um, Songs For You was, was sort of born out of that, essentially. So did you write all the songs as well? Or did you have uh, some help and a lot of uh, partners in this? Or is this kind of just really your baby from start to finish? So it is really my baby. I did write all the songs, um, but I obviously had some extraordinary um, help in the composition and the the, uh, the instrumentation, the production side of things. Um, Jesse Sieberberg and John Olagia, who have both worked with some incredible people over the years from Herbie Hancock and and uh, John Mayer and the Lucas Nelson band. And uh, so I knew I was in sort of safe hands, getting it towards um, the kind of sort of 70s nostalgic music that I love so much, um, which kind of influences it. But it, yeah, it was important for me after 20 years of being, you know, directed and written for and edited that I make something really from me, something intimate and authentic. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I sent the producers versions of the songs that I played on that piano there. Uh, just on voice notes on my phone, and then we built them up gently over a year into into uh, what they've become. So is this something that, is it one and done, or is this now, because it's so much of a passion for you, we see more albums coming in the future? I hope, I hope so. I would love to do, uh, I would love to do covers albums and Christmas albums, and I would love to do, so I would love to tour with some songs, and obviously uh, more songs, uh, you know, my lyric notebook is, is still full of, um, it's still full of songs that don't have music yet, lonely, lonely songs that are unmarried. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it will definitely be something that I, that I keep pursuing in between the acting. Um, I'm not going to sort of ditch that just yet. It's, um, it's uh, you know, something that I love equally um, and, uh, and, and I've nurtured over such a long period of time. So, so it's definitely not something I'm, I'm, I'm giving up, but um, uh, it would definitely love to find find space to do to do more music uh, over the next coming years. Now, a lot of artists, uh, especially these days, because of the way we download music, you know, a lot of people don't buy full albums. Why did you choose to go the route of releasing a full album instead of just you know one song at a time, like a lot of artists do? I think because I love bodies of work that sort of go together. And that was the way I grew up on, on sort of albums that sort of went together. Obviously it's not a, like a full length album. It's an EP, so it's only five songs, um, which is not something I really uh, found a lot of when I was growing up, but um, it seemed a sort of more manageable size of project for me at this, at this juncture. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think these songs just felt like they went together. And the point of this for me was to share it with the world and get it out um and sort of release it from my system almost and 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 sort of to be able to say that i was a musician and a songwriter and that no one can take that away now and and that i wanted to kind of um you know share something a bit more personal um with with people who've been so supportive of me over the years you know this all started essentially because i started doing covers of songs at my piano on on uh, social media, et cetera. And, uh, and people were so encouraging and so buoying, you know, from, from oh, uh, you know, I really love your singing voice through to like, where's the album? Give us an album. So uh, that fervor was, was, uh, was very encouraging. And um, it sort of just ended up being, being, being what it is. Now, you're obviously used to acting and directing and being in front of people all the time, but is it a little different when you release an album? Is it a little bit more nerve wracking? You know, you're really kind of putting it out there and it's something different or was this just very natural for you? 
yeah it's a very good question it, I, I i am sort of used to being in front of people but there was some hesitancy about or there was a thought of hesitancy about sharing sort of stories from or feelings from your life you know this feels it feels like things that you would you would really only talk about with your with your family or closest closest people but i think once you realize that the things that help people through situations so so often are understanding that they're not by them and they're not alone and just reminders of hope and i think that's what sort of the the thematic connection of the songs on on the ep is that they're all sort of about hope really and um so so once i sort of accepted that i wasn't i wasn't anxious anymore and i realized the reception will be what it is regardless of what i say about it so um it, you know really just doing it for for me and and for and for for anyone who listens to it and feels like it's for them well ben congratulations and thank you so much again for speaking with us today if people are looking to find the album i guess all the traditional platforms is that correct yep it's it's, it's everywhere it's on all the dsps you know Apple music and spotify and all that but the, my the link in my uh bio on on instagram has all the has all the info you could ever hope for and, and a lot of info that you are not interested in <laughs> <laughs> well ben it's been a pleasure thank you so much and good luck we look forward to hearing more music and and seeing you on the screen again as well thank you so much I'm joined here now by poet Zaida Pesada. Now, I was reading your bio and you've done quite a lot of different things, but for people who don't know you, I'll just get you to give some background into yourself. I mean, I started off as everyone does in many ways, um, finding out what I like to read and what I like to study and perhaps where my interests and curiosities are. And from a young age, they were in athletics, they were in arts and writing, and then they were also in understanding history and politics. And so I brought those worlds together and what I've done in my life so far is, uh, professionally, I've worked in a few things in anti-human trafficking in Colombia for a little, um, as a part of my graduate school experience. I then moved on to acting in television on CBS for some time. It was a reality uh, show that we worked quite hard in creating, building that experience. And that experience was centered around a lot of the work I had done in graduate school and in college, open source intelligence. And that led me to where I am today. I am an advisor at one of the top IT security consulting firm and advisory firms, analyst firms, even Gartner. So I've done random things. And then in my own time, I've competed for some time in uh, powerlifting and various other kinds of sports and I, my arts, my book. And, you know, you touched on your writing, but how did you first originally get started writing? I was just inspired by my grandfather, my mother's father. He was a poet, and he was well-versed in so many languages. German, Russian, Farsi, Dari, Urdu, Punjabi, Hindi, English. I just admired him from my youth. I wanted to do and be, I wanted to do what he did and be him in so many ways. And he raised me. So that's where the seed came from, that seed for writing and for, for literature. And then my mother, my mother is an avid reader and she's as curious. I come from parents who are multifaceted in ways that makes me so unoriginal uh, and just that idea. So my mother had always um, made it a point to take us to the library, my brother and I, and expose us to different literature and books. And she was always reading. And you know, in many ways, I wanted to be like her as well. So I started reading and I found worlds in writing, worlds I could not experience in it. And I found poetry, more Urdu poetry. So various poets like Fez Ahmed Fez, Mir Taki Mir, Muhammad Iqbal, quite famous poets. And I started reading their work and I was just, enamored by the different ways you could speak to spirituality and love. So with your debut book, are these kind of the themes that you touch on? Lucid House Publishing, uh, Connor, who is one of the founders of Lucid House Publishing, is a friend of mine, and used to just write some of my poetry on Instagram or different places, and he found me and he said, you've got, you got to do something with this. And I was never the kind of person to do something with it. 
then, it, you know, uh, when COVID-19 hit, I was at home and the only way I could cope through everything I was going through was through art and exercise. And if I wasn't exercising, I was writing prolifically. And kurban in the Urdu language, even in Arabic, means a sacrifice. And there was a lot that I felt as though I had to release, to get out, to, um, I don't know, to, to become through. So what Qurban actually is, yes, it's inspired by the poets. It's also inspired by several romanticists, naturalists, and um, different kinds of schools of poetry. But what the purpose of the book was to do was to open the world up to how I feel about my sexuality, how I feel about the socio-political climate in the United States as of current, and to the journey I went through in love throughout that time. It's very current. There aren't many pieces that um, come from my past. Soon enough, I'll, I'm working on the second book where I will revamp and take a lot of the pieces throughout my life and put it into there. This was for the time. And if anyone is looking to buy the book, where should they go? There are so many places. I, I'm not going to give a shout out to any one place to say that they're better than the other. I know people are avid consumers of uh, products from Amazon. So it is on Amazon. Um, and, and otherwise, it's at Barnes & Noble. It's on Kobo. It's various places. If you're to look up Kurban by Zaira Pirzada, it should be many different places. So of your choosing, of your choosing. Thank you so much for your time today, Zaida. Absolutely. Thank you as well for having me. Taking a look, another look at your seven-day forecast, we do have that high of seven degrees tomorrow, and that is pretty consistent throughout the week. But there, we will be seeing some sun, but as we go into Wednesday, it will be that mix of sun and cloud with a high of nine degrees. And as that seven continues, there is a close to 60% chance that we will see some rain on Saturday. So that weekend, we might be getting a little bit more precipitation compared to during the week. But as we head into the start of next week, Monday will be your, 11 will be your high on Monday. Thanks so much, Jasmine. That's all the time we have for right now, but we'll have more local news for you in the next hour.